stars they wept the morning sun was there. the savior of the world was fallen his body on the cross his blood poured out for us the weight of every cross upon him
with nothing to offer. Lord, we come with empty hands. Lord, we receive your forgiveness. We receive your redemption. Lord, you have called us to you to enjoy and glorify you forever. So, Lord, as we gather in your name, as we gather as a church, would you bless us? Would you bless your people? We ask this boldly. We ask this with anticipation. Lord, we trust that you hear us and you long to do good to us. We thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Please have a seat. Good morning, everyone. Happy Easter. He is risen. Okay, one more time. I know we're Presbyterians, but we can do better. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Just welcome everyone here. It's good to see so many people here. Just a few announcements. Uh, college Young Adults and Agape, if you want to get involved with that, please do. Our Agape groups, we have two Bible studies. They spread from all the way from Maslin in the south, Westlake to Mentor in the east. And so if you want to get involved, our families are growing. If you want to be part of that, you can. And the Young Adults as well in our college group. It's massive, as you can see. And so if you want to get involved, please speak to our leaders. Also, we have a college lock-in, April 19th and 20th. If you're interested, I think the sign-up is going to come up soon. There's a great, we have a guest speaker as well. He's actually the chaplain for the Cleveland Guardians baseball team. And so uh, we have him, um, Pastor Mike Sue, to come and preach during those two days. Please speak to the leaders. Okay, this is just very important. So we have our Easter meal today. We have bibimbap, okay? This is what we need to do because we have so many people. We probably need to make a line this way instead of this way because the praise team needs this uh, middle space. Also, the newcomer, I mean, the people who came early didn't have the numbers, but you should have a number on your thing. Um, that's your rank in heaven. I'm just kidding. No, that's your table. That's your table number. Okay, that's your table. I'm just kidding. That's a table number. Uh, okay, we encourage you to speak, uh, sit there. If you don't have a number, you're a free agent. You're not bound by the laws of heaven. Okay, but... It'd be nice. The families, and also, let, please let the families eat, uh, get their food first. Let them cut in, okay? Because trust me, it's difficult. And also, those who have babies during the worship service, I have no problem, I'm serious, of kids crying or anything. They're always welcome. What? What? Oh, no line. Oh, we're going to serve, uh, and these servers are going to serve you, and no tip is needed, okay? So... Oh, no line. Praise God. Okay? And so please, let's take all the service and the people preparers. Okay, let's give them a hand. Okay? Right. But, uh, and so please, after the service, though, if we can have, like, the tables all set up and the chairs all arranged, okay, that would be great. But please let the families eat first. And like I said, if, if, you're, if you have babies during the service, I have no problem them crying and screaming. I don't care. They're welcome. I'm serious. What I do have a problem is you can even sleep during the service. What I can't stand is you snoring, because that really then offends everybody, okay? And so if you snore, please use that elbow as an act of mercy. At this time, we're going to have the time of offering. We'll have a time of offering at this time.
Father, we thank you, especially on this day, the most important day in the history of the world. We are so thankful for giving us the greatest gift, the greatest gift of humankind. We thank you so much for your son. Thank you so much that so many of us have an ability to give to the kingdom of God, to help those who are marginalized, those who are poor, those who are needy, Lord. We thank you and praise you. Spread this ministry to help people so that we can be a blessing to the world. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If we could all stand up at this time, if you can, let's join together in confessing our faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Ghost, born in the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Amen. Knowing that we've all sinned and fall short of God's glory, let us confess our sins to God together in silence at this time. believe in the good news of Jesus Christ. In him we're forgiven. Amen. humankind to be redeemed through your son Jesus Christ we thank you so much for over 30 years as he lived here in pain and agony and suffering but because of his great love for us died on the cross for our sins and was resurrected from the dead you are truly risen you are risen indeed and I pray father that we know that we can readily tap into that resurrection power the power to forgive, the power to love those who are unlovable, the, po the power to be gracious and kind when the world says that we should respond in, in, in retaliation, in anger, in resentment, in bitterness. Change us, transform us as you did the early apostles and the followers. Those who had no hope now have hope. Those who had no life now have life. And those who had no love now have love. We thank you also, Father, that because of the resurrection power, because you saved us, we can have this intimate relationship with you, primarily through the Word of God, through people and prayer. And thank you for teaching us 2,000 years ago the prayer of all prayers. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you could all turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12 to 28. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12 to 28. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. 
For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did, but he did not raise him for it if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those who have also fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God, the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything has been under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him, who put everything under him so that God may be all in all. This is the word of God. I know that we are Presbyterians. We don't do this very much, and we're going to do this throughout the sermon. This is something that I've done every Easter. We should do it every day, okay? But we're going to do the greeting one more time. Christ is reason, risen. <laughs> okay, okay, I messed it up again. So, hey, let me speak English. Christ is risen. Okay, one more time. Christ is risen. Okay. Well, welcome, everyone. Happy Resurrection Day. There's three groups of people I want to talk to today, okay? One, the regular attenders, regular members. It's great to see you guys again. I've never seen some of you guys look so good. I wear a suit twice a year, Christmas and Easter, okay? And also good to see first-time visitors. You're welcome. You came at a good time. We have free food for you. And also, I'd lovingly, please don't get offended, I'd love to uh, also welcome all the CEOs, Christmas and Easter only of people come here, okay? We welcome you, okay? But we, we welcome you as well. First of all, I, I just want to acknowledge that this is a very special weekend, as you know, okay? And Easter is one of those times when people feel like they have to be at church, right? I know some of you probably got that speech from your spouse, probably the female spouse, okay? You can't skip church on Easter speech, okay? And, and she probably told you, you know, Jesus rose from the dead, you need to get out of bed, okay? And I know of one conversation that happened between a husband and a wife, okay? She was upstairs getting ready already, and she thought he was as well. But when she came out, he was still sitting in his pajamas watching TV. And she's like, why are you not ready? We need to go to church. He's like, I don't want to go to church. Why not? I have three reasons of not wanting to go to church. Number one, no one is friendly to me. No one likes me. Number two, everyone is suspicious of me. And number three, I just don't like it. I don't like church. This is her response. Well, first, that's not completely true. There are some friendly people there, and some people do like you. Number two, that, that suspicion is mainly in your head. And number three, you're the stinking pastor, okay? You have to go to church, okay? True confession. Sometimes I don't want to preach on Easter Sunday, okay? It is a lot of pressure to preach on Easter Sunday. This is the day of all days, okay? This is like Super Bowl Sunday for us, okay? This is like Super Bowl Sunday for us. And that's a lot of pressure. One of my first sermons that I did about 28 years ago, one of my pastor mentors told me this when I first started to preach. Che, just relax, bro, okay? Don't try to be so witty. Don't try to be so funny. Don't try to be so smart, okay? Don't try to be so smart. Just be yourself, okay? I wasn't really encouraged by that. You basically called me dumb, okay? But seriously, it's so good to see so many of you guys today. And on Easter Day, over a billion people, a billion people are celebrating today, okay? Can you imagine that? So I'm going to do it again. Throughout the sermon, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And so we, we are going to celebrate a man. I don't know if you ever heard of him. His name is Jesus, okay? Who taught like no man has ever taught who loved like no one's ever loved. And he especially had a heart for people on the margins, people who were poor, who were sick, the widows, the orphans, 
okay, for the excluded, those who have been excluded from society. And on this Friday, his great courage got him arrested. His great love led him to the cross, and his great heart stopped beating. On Friday, which looked like a horribly tragic ending to such a wonderful life, turned out to be a greatest sacrifice of life, of love in the history of the world. And on Saturday, there was silence, for the king was sleeping. And he entered into death, into hell for you and me. But then on Sunday, a stone got rolled away. The tomb was empty. Hope got fulfilled. On Sunday, the death lost its sting. Grave lost its victory. On Sunday, hell was defeated. Death was dethroned. Darkness was derailed. I say this rap almost every other Easter, okay? This rap that I'm going to tell you. Okay, we're gonna, not tell you. Kinda, I'm not going to sing, okay? But so the devil was demotivated. Faith, faith was vindicated. The prophets were validated. The soldiers were aggravated. The religious leaders were infuriated. The disciples were animated. His followers were liberated. And after today's service, when we eat a bibimbap, okay, we'll be constipated. But you know what I'm saying? Okay, that's what's happening. On Sunday, sin, lost, shame, die, hope, sore, love, won. And so we now have something to live for, something beyond your life to live for and to die for. And we have hope. That's what Resurrection Sunday is all about. N.T. Wright says this, Bishop N.T. Wright. The central proclamation of the greatest victory over the darkest enemy by the noblest hero for the loftiest cause in all of human history. One more time. The central proclamation of the greatest victory over the darkest enemy by the noblest hero for the loftiest cause in all of human history. If anything in this sorry, dark, evil world is worthy of celebration, it's that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, amen? And that means everything is different. Everything changed on Easter Sunday. Listen, I mentioned this three years ago. People have not gathered for the past 2,000 years to merely say the stock market has risen. It has risen indeed. We're not here to say inflation rate has risen. It really has risen indeed. Okay. We're not here to say the value of the dollar has risen. It has really risen indeed. Nvidia stock has risen. It has risen indeed. Praise God for me. Anyway, your, okay, your 401k has risen. It has risen indeed. But that hope has been spread across all millennia and culture and country for 2,000 years. In the face of difficulty, poverty, war, and famine, and hardship, people were able to persevere because Christ is risen. He has risen indeed. And 2,000 years ago, the most unique person that's ever lived, Jesus and Adam, made that unique claim that no man or woman has ever made to be the Son of God from eternity. Buddha, Muhammad, never said, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, there's some crazies that said that, like David Koresh. But they usually have people with white coats that lead you into a certain institution if you say that you are Jesus, if you are God. But Siddhartha, Moses, Muhammad, none of them ever made that claim that I am the resurrection and the life. But Jesus claimed that his death would be the means by which sin and evil would be conquered once for all. And he did not just leave men and women to reason for themselves whether it was true or not. He gave us a confirming sign. It was the most sensational vindication to any claim that's ever been given. And that sign was that he was going to rise from the dead. You know, the first gospel that was preached is called the proto Ungelion, is Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. It's when God told Adam and Eve, your offspring will be bruised in the heel, but he will crush, he will smash the head of the serpent. And that is what happened. It was fulfilled on crucifixion and the resurrection. And that event became the watershed human event of all events in human history. Everything before that was what? B.C., before Christ. Everything after that, if you know your Latin, Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. You know, it's, it's interesting. Compared to other religions, we can trace it back to one event. That's not actually true for Buddhism, Judaism, Islam, even Islam, or, or even atheism. You look at all the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the last week makes the majority of the Gospels. Have you noticed? One week. There's hardly anything about his first 30 years. Okay? Do you know what this last week is called? Passion Week. Oh, my gosh. Shame on you. No Korean soup for you today. Okay? Oh, my gosh. It's Passion Week. You know, most Korean churches require their staff and elders to go to 
early morning prayer every day during Passion Week. That's why me and Elder Phil decided to be out of town this week, okay? I'm just kidding. That's, our kids were in spring break. But anyway, okay, but this event made this bold and audacious claim that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead. Now, some people are skeptical about this because we're sophisticated. We're modern, okay? We are, gen, what was it, Gen Z, Gen Alpha, Millennial, Boomers. I don't know what generation you are. Some of you don't believe in God because you are like Nacho Libro's friend and you only believe in science. Listen, God invented science. Do you understand? Good science flows from good theology. But we moderns believe that, oh, people in the past are so gullible. They're so prehistoric. I mentioned this before. C.S. Lewis calls this chronological snobbery. That somehow you think your generation is smarter and more wise than the generations before us. Ancient people are not stupid. Dead people tend to stay dead. It's our generation that has turned like mostly dead, kind of dead, okay? All dead. Okay, we sophisticated people are actually the gullible ones. Somehow we think because we have a sixth sense, we can see dead people. That's not true. I love what that British scholar N.T. Wright says. You can you put it up, okay? You can put it up. Behold, okay? All right? All right? You're, okay. There's only one explanation that accounts for the overnight transformation of an impoverished, confused, frightened little group of people into a courageous, emboldened community that would sacrifice everything, including their lives to turn the world upside down, and that is that they actually believe this. There are many messianic movements in the first century. In every case, the would-be Messiah got crucified by Rome as Jesus did. And this is what he writes. In not one single case do we hear the slightest mention of the disappointed followers claiming their hero had been raised from the dead because they knew better. But Jesus did appear. And within two decades of Paul and Peter's life, okay, and then, you know, uh, Christ appeared to them. And then he appeared to 500 of them when he wrote it. Now, you don't say that within 20 years until you know you can back it up. Listen, the disciples were not smart enough or creative enough to make up a story like this. They, they, they did not have imaginative, creative minds. They were not even clear if Jesus was to be crucified or resurrected, remember? They were not even sure. They were confused. You don't get the idea of a bodily resurrection with brains like Peter. No offense. But in short, the disciples were like us. They're common people. They believe that you can have the resurrection, but still have the world. Isn't that true for most of us? We want to have Easter and still have our world, right, unrocked by the resurrection. Aren't we amazingly, self, you know, well-adjusted to the status quo, to the world? And that's why in the book of Matthew, it says that Easter is an earthquake that shook the whole world. But we modern, sophisticated types, we love to explain the resurrection away. But you cannot explain the resurrection away. The resurrection explains us, us, us away. I mean, all throughout history, I'm not going to get through it. I'm just going to briefly go through it. I do it almost every um, Easter. There are all kinds of theories have been uh, basically, well, you know, written or talked about in the last 2,000 years. The world came up with unbelievably crazy theories on why Christ was not resurrected. It actually takes more faith to believe in these crazy theories. And they were conjured up by the greatest lawyers in the last 2,000 years. And they're part of a large law, for law firm, firm, the greatest law firm that this world has ever produced. The law firm's name is Dumb, Dumber, and Dumbest. That's the name of the law firm. Now, after, I don't have to go through all the crazy theories. Let me just briefly go through it. Remember the Swoon Theory? It was made by a guy 1,600 years later by an Italian guy named Venturini. I think his first name was Ace. Okay? He says that Jesus was just kind of like, wasn't dead. He was stimulated by the spices. He somehow was able to take 100 pounds of linen cloth off, move 800 pounds of stone, go through elite guards, okay, who would be executed if they let anyone pass. That's called the Swoon Theory. The hallucination theory, that everyone who saw Jesus was hallucinated. These days, I've been hallucinated. I've been seeing numbers. I've been watching Three Body Problem. The other day, I was, I was driving up 77, I saw these numbers. Oh, the debt. You see that uh, sign that says the debt of America? I've, I've been seeing numbers. They say on theory that sometimes some sort of powerful medium conjured up the image of Jesus, but means occult power. The telepathic theory. There was, that, there was no physical resurrection of Jesus Christ at all, but rather 
God sent these divine telepathic messages to his followers. The mistaken identity theory that that was not really Jesus who died. He was an imposter. The theft theory, the body of Jesus was stolen. The 11 disciples became Ocean's 11. They became master thieves. They're able to steal. It takes so much faith, and I just went through it. There's actually an apologetic seminar by our teacher, Tony Ying, on April 17th, in case if you want to get more into it. But listen, it, it takes more faith to believe in those crazy theories than the resurrection itself. The Jewish leaders, they could have found the body if, they, if, if it was dead, right? They had huge resources of men. They have tons of money. They had the back end of the greatest empire in the history of humankind. It would be utterly impossible for 11 weak, cowardly, uneducated men to have succeeded, okay, in, in, in any length of time. The simplest way to disprove the resurrection was to what? To show the body for the whole world to see. And yet the Sanhedrin did. They didn't even try to attempt to find the body. Do you know why? Do you know they didn't even try to search for it? Because deep inside, they knew that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. And they still did not believe. Isn't that amazing? All right? Another theory is that it's called a sleep theory, that they fell asleep, all the guards fell asleep during my sermon, okay? But that's not, that's not probably a recent, recent one. I mean, that's a recent one. You know, it's Chuck Colson. I don't know if you know him. He was special counsel to President Nixon. For those old timers, those who are 54 and younger, okay? He was a special counsel to President Nixon. And he was one of President Nixon's inner circle. And you ever heard of the Watergate scandal? Okay, it was when the, some of his henchmen went into the Democratic National Headquarters in Washington, D.C. Okay, he said that Watergate scandal proved to him that the resurrection must have happened. He became a Christian in prison. And you remember when the Watergate scandal was first found out by Forrest Gump? Okay, and he and then he and, but this is what he said. This is Chuck Colson saying, 10 men met together secretly and came up with a story. And they swore together on life that we're going to maintain this story. These are the toughest, most powerful men in the world. We're going to tell the same story, okay? Within three weeks, everyone caved in. And this is his point. You're telling me that a dozen uneducated, untrained fishermen, and eventually 500, could maintain a lie, a, a lie under duress and torture for 40 years without a single one of them caving in? Absolutely impossible. Okay? So you're telling me that thousands of followers were willing to die for a lie? Are you telling me that? And somehow managed to turn the world upside down, built on illusions and falsehoods, that they're willing to willingly lie, die for a lie? It takes more faith to believe in the theories, these crazy theories, than that the, the historical truth of the resurrection. Listen, everything stands or falls under the resurrection. And that's the central message of the whole book of Acts. Listen, I don't know where you are, okay, in your relationship with Christ, or maybe you don't have a relationship. I, I just ask you to be fair and not be biased. I want to read uh, uh, a quote by Dr. Thomas Arnold. Okay, he, he actually passed away. He's a professor of modern history at Oxford. He wrote a three-volume history of Rome. This is what he says. He was not a Christian initially, but he became because of the overwhelming evidence of the resurrection. The evidence for Jesus' life, death and resurrection, has been shown to be satisfactory. According to the standards of any historian, it holds up according to the common rules to, for distinguishing good evidence from bad. Tens of thousands of persons have gone through it, piece by piece, as carefully as any judge reviewing the most important case. I have myself done this many times over, not to persuade others, but to satisfy myself. Throughout my life, I have made a career of studying the histories of time and events, examining and weighing the evidence for what was written about each of them. And I know of no other one fact in history which is proved by better and fuller evidence than this one, that Jesus Christ died and rose again from the dead. This is an unbiased historian that eventually realized he must have been resurrected. Listen, whether or not you agree with it, Okay? Resurrection is not an optional message in the church. Okay? Without that message, everything else will fall apart. It all hinges on this. This is the most essential, important event in human history. Cosmic history, actually. The resurrection of our Lord. 
And T. Rice says this, have you ever considered what would happen if Christ was not raised from the dead? There would be no validation for anything that he had taught. Everything he had said was false if he did not raise from the dead. The act, act of sacrifice for us, the payment that we all rejoice in, that payment is now no longer valid. He is not the Messiah. So the binding truth of our whole Bible, that of the coming Messiah is not fulfilled, then our Bible is not true. Thus, the whole idea of monotheism, of an infinite personal God, this God now completely breaks down. And now you have no assurance for the uniqueness of man as a creation from God, the universe, and a testimony to the wisdom of his creation, to the absoluteness of right and wrong. There is no moral morality. Everything breaks down. And those institutions that started because of the biblical witness of this man's resurrection, like hospitals, like universities, and schools, they no longer have a place when, if we are just but dust. Without the resurrection, everything falls apart, and the dominoes of culture itself, civilization, collapse. If Christ has not been raised from the dead, we are all dead in our sins. We are men and women to be most pitied, okay? We would have believed in the greatest lie and not the greatest story ever told. Okay, young people, what, I, what it's saying, and excuse my bad language, okay? There's a lot of bad language in the Bible. If Christ was not raised from the dead, we are all screwed, okay? We are the dumbest, most gullible, idiotic, wasteful people in the world. We're the most pity. And I think that's a great way to start our liturgy, okay? Presbyterian liturgy. If you don't like this, you can email elderj at yahweh.com, okay? You can complain to him. But if Christ was not raised from the dead, we are screwed. And you should respond, we are all screwed indeed. Seriously, if Christ was not raised from the dead, we are all screwed. We are screwed indeed. Okay? Can I ask maybe even a deeper question instead of just the intellectual part, even more deeply and personally? Isn't this what your, what your heart really been searching for, yearning for all your life? Isn't there something, about, something in your heart that's yearning for something more? Is, isn't there something there? that you know deep inside that you're not some sort of big cosmic accident. That love and meaning and consciousness are not just, what, biolo biological illusions. That in the end, we don't just merely return to dust and become fertilizer, and become nothing. And that all of life is. Isn't there something in your heart, in the words of Blas Pascal says, this must be true. This has to be true. This is true. Listen, the resurrection is not a brief respite from death. It's a participation in what God's doing eternally. And one way or another, we are here because the risen Christ sought you, caught you, commandeered you for God's purposes. And there lies our hope, death and life, death and life beyond death. There's a whole eternity riding on this event. Did you know if Christ was not crucified and Christ was not resurrected, none of us would, would exist? You guys all had beautiful babies. Your kids not would exist. You would not exist. Time itself would completely be gone if the cross and the resurrection did not happen, okay? And so listen, I, I, I always fear when I talk about this in this way. Some of you who don't believe, you say this. This is what I hate about you Christians. You're always trying to convert us. Do you know what I had to say to that? You're absolutely right. I am trying to convert you. But can you not at least understand why I'm trying to? Okay? There's an atheist, Penn Gillette. This is what he says. A lot of my atheist friends get mad. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. A lot of my atheist friends get mad when Christians try to convert them. I actually don't. I actually respect that. For me, what I don't understand are why Christians who believe in this stuff, they don't try to convert me. How much do you have to hate us atheists for you not to tell us the most important and cherished belief? Why do you hate us so much? If you really believe this, wouldn't you want to share this with everyone? Okay? Do you hate us that much for not sharing life, words of life to us? Isn't that interesting? This atheist is mad because you're not sharing what you believe in. He doesn't believe in it, but that's the point. Do we really believe in this? Okay? 
so listen, I'm not going to force you, pressure you, but I think you deserve to know the truth about the resurrection so that you can decide. But as a Christian, I do believe he was raised in the dead. God has done all of this for you. He says, I am your forgiver. I am your guide. I will be your strength. I will be your friend. Some of you drifted away from God a long time ago. I don't care how far you drifted away from God. It's not farther that, that God did in Christ at the cross. He reached a lot more people than you, than you have. Maybe you come from an utterly different religious background. This is not about a religious background. This is not about religion. It's about having a relationship with Christ. And you can say yes today. But what a great way to do it. If you just let go of your fear and confusion and pride or sin, whatever keeps keeping you from God, okay? So that's the challenge I have for you, for those who don't believe. I want you to be at least fair because I believe the evidence demands a verdict. And I believe there's overwhelming evidence that Christ was raised. And if he was raised, you have a very important decision to make. And for those, finally, who call themselves disciples of Jesus Christ, according to us, the resurrection of the past is not just the history of the past. It makes us powerful in the present. It's not just a new philosophy to live by. It's not a new set of moral regulations and re resolutions to do better. It's not, it's about the infusion of resurrection power. You know, I, I'll be honest. A lot of times we hear that gospel is just turning a new leaf. No, I, I'm kind of tired of, 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 hearing, of hearing Christians say this. The Christian life is just to be good people. No, it's not just to be a good person. The gospel is about power. Raw, life-changing, transformative power. At the center of Christianity, it's not a new moral code. It's about an empty tomb from a Savior that was raised from the dead for us. And so Easter is up to you now. Jesus says, you disciples are the ones going to finish my story. If, as I've given my hands and my feet to you, you are now to be his hands and feet to the world. One writer says this, in your life where my life will be revealed. You are my body now, the body of Christ. You will bear witness to my love, desire, and concern for everybody. You are to embody life in the world to take care of other people's bodies as I've taken care of yours. You will be the ones who carry on the ministry of my hands. You'll be the ones who will comfort those bodies that are sad and lonely. You'll be the ones who will feed the hungry and heal the sick. You'll be the ones who will reach out to those who don't believe that are worthy of love, the ones who have been abused, forgotten, and marginalized. You are the body of Christ, witnesses to the resurrection, conduits of Easter. So guys, KCPC, don't, do not fear, do not doubt. Wherever you are, there is an Easter, and this Easter power continues through you. Because on the cross, the world did all it could do on Jesus. But on Jesus, but on Easter, God did all God could do to shape this world in your life. That is the power of resurrection. And that same power is in us, the power to love, the power to forgive, the power to serve, the power to live life. Okay? That is the power. You know, this is, I think it's a true story. I'm not totally sure. It was a Sunday school class, second graders, eight, seven or eight year old. And one of the kids asked, what was the first words of Jesus when he were, appeared to the disciples? Okay, that, that was a second grade girl asked the teacher, Sunday school teacher, what were the first words that Jesus said to his disciples when he reappeared, when he was resurrected? And she, she was like, oh, uh, I don't know. And another second grader, boy, interrupted and said, I know what he said. The first words he said when he saw his disciples after he was resurrected was, ta-da, ta-da, right? You don't merely explain that. You witness that power. Christ is risen. Oh my gosh. Christ is risen. Okay, can we be a little Pentecostal today? Okay, Christ is risen. Okay, okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you. You're a great God. Thank you so much for so many people being here today. And I pray just if they just contain one kernel of truth and really change their life. No guilt, no self-condemnation. Lord, you wipe that away on the cross. But every day is a new day to be born again. Every day is a new day of salvation. Guilt, condemnation, let that be passed away. But I do pray, Father, for our hearts to be open to truth. 
for our hearts to be open to the evidences that are clearly there. And most of all, the love that is clearly there. The love of the church, the love of the scriptures, the love of prayer, the love of our family and friends. We are not an accident. We all have a purpose in life to bless the world. And most of all, the love of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit find all of us. We thank you and praise you. Bless everyone here. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand up at this time, okay, for our final song.
and you can help with the tables. And uh, remember, they're going to serve you. They're going to serve you, okay? Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great Easter.